Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day. It is indeed a day that you have made, and we rejoice in it. Lord, we pray that as we continue moving through and studying Mark chapter 13, we pray that you would show us exactly what we need to see for this time in history. Lord, now we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each and every one of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Okay. Last week, we began to go through the apocalyptic chapter of Mark chapter 13. Remember, though the word apocalypse has come to mean uh, something catastrophic in nature in our time, that is not its original meaning. Its original meaning from the Greek word apocalypsis. We get the word apocalypse. The word apocalypsis means disclosure or revelation. Okay, disclosure or revelation. That's what the, the Greek word apocalypsis means. Jesus was about to disclose something to his disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And uh, that they would not have known otherwise except for the fact that Jesus was giving them this information. And the purpose of Jesus telling the disciples this was so that uh, they would be prepared for what was going to come. That's what prophecy is all about, is to prepare us for what's coming. Prophecy is foretelling, letting us know what's going on possibly right now, but also possibly in the near future and sometimes in the, in the distant future. So Jesus did not want them to be uninformed, and he certainly doesn't want us to be in, uninformed. It's like the word that I read a while ago uh, from J Cindy Jacobs, a, a, a woman who has been prophesying actually since she was three. So, isn't that amazing? Let me tell you how that happened. She went up to her mother and she said, I'm going to have a sister. And her mother's like, we're not going to have any more children. No, I'm going to have a sister. She got a sister. Her mother just didn't know it at the time that she was pregnant. <laughs> so anyway, so her life, you know, ever since then, you know, she said, I always was kind of odd. But anyway, but the, the uh, prophecy and the entire purpose of the Bible and the entire Bible is prophetic. Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so the Bible, God wants us to know those things that we can't naturally know. So it has to be revealed to us. So God spoke through his prophets before Jesus came. Okay? Then Jesus came. And now God is speaking through his prophets now. Now, can any and every believer in Jesus hear the Lord? Yes. Absolutely. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Okay? But not everybody stands or operates in the office of prophet. Okay? Some people, like Cindy Jacobs, are called to that office. Not everybody. But the Lord wants us to know what's going on. He does not want us to be in the dark. Okay? Then we can know and prepare for the things that are coming. They're not going to surprise us like they will might likely surprise a lot of other people. Anyway, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he's telling them about the things that are about to come upon the earth. And that's a good thing. Last week, we heard a compelling testimony about the fact that the uh, stones of the temple and the temple buildings and the whole complex, not one of them would be left upon another. The Jews go to the Western Wailing Wall and they say that Jesus' words didn't come to pass because we still have that Western Wailing Wall. 
But Robert Cornuk in all of his research says that that's not, that wall that, that they use is the Western Whaling Wall, that is not part of the temple complex. That was part of the Roman Fort Antonia. But you know, the church doesn't always talk about Fort Antonia. In fact, I didn't even know there was a Fort Antonia until last week. And they were, the Fort Antonia and the temple complex were so close together, there was a bridge between them, two bridges. That's close. So, Eusebius and Josephus, they both testify to the fact that there just wasn't anything left of the temple complex. So Jesus was absolutely correct when he said that not one stone was going to be left upon another. Now we get to verse 3. As he, meaning Jesus, was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John and Andrew were questioning him privately. Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? And Jesus began to say to them, Okay, before we get into the specifics of what Jesus began to say to them, Let's notice that Jesus does not say, that's on a need-to-know basis and y'all don't need to know. <laughs> he did not say, it's above your pay grade. All right? No. He begins to tell them. He begins to reveal. He begins to disclose the things that are going to come about. They ask Jesus, what signs would they see that would be a signal to them that the things Jesus was speaking of was coming to pass. And the first one, of course, that he said was you know, the, the temple coming down, not one stone left upon another. And then the next marker, the next sign was going to be this. He says, see to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name saying, I am he and will mislead many. So Jesus' first statement to them is a word of warning. See to it that no one misleads you. See to it that no one causes you to roll away from the truth. See to it that no one seduces you into error. What kind of error does Jesus mean here? He tells us exactly what he's meaning. He says, many will come in my name saying, I am he, and will mislead many. So many are going to come, and many will be misled. What does Jesus mean? How is it possible for many to come in his name and many to be misled? Well, let's look at this. First of all, let's look at what the phrase, in my name, means. Jesus says, many are going to come in my name. What does that little phrase, in my name, mean? It means this. The name of someone in the sense that the Bible authors use it, was what the person stood for. The substance of their character or their authority. Okay? It's what they stood for. The substance of their character or their authority. What Jesus tells his disciples and us in this warning is that there will be many who will come representing Jesus standing even in an official position, you know, supposedly standing for all he stands for, and yet these will deceive many. Now this might seem to be impossible, and yet it has been occurring since the first century. Now we're very familiar with what was happening in the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. Okay? The papacy... You know, and the, the official clergy of the Roman Catholic Church, wherever the church was to be found. In other words, those who officially represented the church in all the little towns and villages, wherever the Roman Catholic Church was, they were representatives of Jesus Christ. They stood in his name. Nevertheless, they taught that a person was not made right with God through the gracious work of God's Son, but through their own efforts. Works were the way to eternal life, not grace through faith. But the Bible
Bible clearly declares that it is by grace through faith that we're saved. It's a gift of God, not of works. And many, many millions of people over the course of centuries were deceived by that. Okay? Jesus saves, and yet the Roman Catholic Church taught that there was a purgatory that people would go to to work out their own sins and everything in order to get from purgatory into heaven. And then in Martin Luther's time, and this had been happening for a while, but they were selling indulgences. A person would pay so much money in order to help a loved one get out of purgatory. I know it's amazing. But there was a little rhyme in Martin Luther's day that was being, you know, it was just this little ditty as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Really? They just made it up. You know, it's not biblical. They just made it up. See how the deception goes, though. So see, there have been deceivers in official positions representing the name of Jesus, and yet they deceive many people. Well, I'm talking at the moment about the Middle Ages. Let's just move forward to now. Should we move forward to now? Of course. Anyway, now we have representatives of the church representing Jesus Christ, declaring a false grace. Some say that once you come to believe in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven, and you can sin all the more because... God's going to forgive you. What does the Bible say? <laughs> Remember, the Bible is it, you know. It's the go-to book for all of the things that we're looking for. The Bible doesn't teach that. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, Shall we sin all the more so that grace can abound? Shall we sin all the more so that grace can abound? And he said, no! He said, we die to sin. How can we go on living in it? That's clear. And that wasn't the only place where Paul makes that emphatic kind of statement. <laughs> so I have no idea how preachers today can declare that you can just sin it up God's going to forgive you because Jesus died on the cross. Don't they know that it was sin that put Jesus on the cross? Sin is an offense to God. It separates people from God. And Jesus went to the cross to be the sacrifice we needed. The cross is the bridge to our Heavenly Father. We're reconciled to God through Jesus Christ because he was nailed to the cross. He shed his blood, he died for us, and then he rose again. How in the world can we go on sinning and take the finished work of Jesus Christ so lightly? Look at what God did. And if we just keep on sinning, we're just, you know, just thumbing our nose at what Jesus said and did. So anyway... That's one side of it. Let's get into the other side. We have entire Christian denominations now, all in the name of Jesus, who supposedly represent Jesus, who have adopted by vote in their legislative assemblies the unbiblical stance that the homosexual lifestyle is okay. God says it's okay. Some people have even said he's doing a new thing. Excuse me, God's not going to break his own word. Never, ever, 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 ever. I cannot believe this. God's word is clear. And God's word can't be overturned by assemblies of denominations. See, see, these denominations are deceiving people into thinking that their lifestyles are acceptable to God and that they will inherit the kingdom of God when, they, when, the God, when God says that their lifestyles are not acceptable and that they will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
But let's not pick just on homosexuals and weird lifestyles. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. He says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. He's also got a really big thing against gossips. So, don't think that one's acceptable to God. But the thing of it is that no matter how filthy anybody is in their sin, Jesus' blood washes away all sin. Paul goes on in this exact same verse. He says, such were, past tense, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Again, Jesus said, see to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and will mislead many. Our pastors, our Christian churches, our whole denominations claiming that Jesus Christ is in fact the Christ of God? Yes. But their teaching on some of these other issues is absolutely contrary to what the Word of God says. So they are nevertheless deceiving those who are listening to them. It's not a good thing. It's a very, very sad thing. And many are going to be excluded from the kingdom of God because they listen to these false teachers. Verse 7. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Okay? Certainly we know that wars and rumors of wars and nations rising up against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms and earthquakes and famines in various places have been going on ever since Jesus uttered these words. But are they not increasing in our time? Yeah, it seemed like 2013 there was a, when it comes to earthquakes and um, volcanic activity, it was just like, whoosh, here was kind of plotting along, you know, and then all of a sudden, whoosh. there are millions of earthquakes these days. And far more above the, above the 4.0 re range that there have been, said that you know, before 2013, you might get a volcano or two burping every now and then. Now there are like 30 of them that are active or more around uh, the globe, particularly around the Ring of Fire in the Pacific area. It's terrible. I mean, it's just like, wow, something is going on. So Jesus spoke of these things as the beginning of birth pangs. Beginning of birth pangs. But every woman knows that, who's ever had a child naturally, everyone knows that as the birth gets closer and closer and closer and closer, you know, the pains get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. I was in the company of somebody, an Italian from New York, on Friday night. Her mother had five children, and she had five children, and she had her first child at the age of 18 and a half. But her mother used to say, talk about the children that she had, and apparently this woman, the firstborn, was the worst experience her mother ever had. All the others after that, it was okay. And so her mother was with her when she was in labor. And she wasn't all that helpful. She started timing and she'd go, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, now! And she's just like, ah! You know? <laughs> so, and I was like, oh. 
I think her mother was just trying to get back at her. <laughs> it's just funny, you know. It's like, but you know, when you have this uptick since 2013 in volcanic activity and earthquakes and troubles, I believe that Jesus' return must be getting closer and closer and closer. You know, now is not the time for us to think that Jesus is not going to be coming in our lifetime because he may come in our lifetime. But I want to take a little bit of a closer look at verse 8 where it says that nations will rise up against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. I think that when we look at the word nations and kingdoms, we think they're interchangeable. Probably so. Seems right to us. Ah, but they are not. The word translated here as nations in the Greek language is the word ethnos. Ethnos. And from that word, of course, we get the word ethnic or ethnicity. Okay? Kingdoms can be made up of many ethnicities. America is a melting pot of ethnicities and ethnic groups, racial groups, okay? And lately, of course, there have been some people who are attempting to stir up the races, the ethnic groups against one another. Are they not? Is this what Jesus may be talking about here? That ethnicities, races within kingdoms are going to rise up against one another. I think it could be. I know there are some that are really trying to do this in America. They're just pushing for it. They're just pushing for it. They're just pushing any little thing. I mean, you've got the, the people on, uh, on George Soros' payroll... All they're waiting for is the text to go to the bus to get to the next place to do the protest. Ask them what they're protesting. They have no idea. They were just told to get on the bus and go protest. The signs all look the same, so you know they're printed in George Soros' printing house. And, um, but yeah, it's, this is the, the ethnicities, the races the ethnos within the kingdoms that are rising against each other. Perry Stone, I'd like to close out with a word from Perry Stone. I'd like you to see it. It fits into this very, very well. He, the, he says that there is a particular plot of the enemy which he calls Satan's Manifesto Against America. And it's about the stirring up between the races, the ethnic groups in America. Let's hear what Perry Stone have to, has to say. Perry, yes. uh, I, I am fascinated by what you call Satan's manifesto against America. Yeah. Explain. Well, let me just say this, that, that there is a plot and a strategy in the United States of Satan himself. And here's the reason why. We are the nation, still are the nation, that promotes the gospel through Christian television. Most of your network's headquarters are in the United States. Now, some are overseas, but most are in the United States. We are still the leading nation for sending missionaries out. The money that comes to support missions comes predominantly from the United States. We are still predominantly the nation to take care of widows and orphans, build Bible schools, print Bibles. So the, the, the job of the enemy is to somehow try to affect in some way, the ability of the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is large. It's not a particular denomination. It's people whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life from all over the world. That's the body of Christ. But it's his job to disrupt the plan of God. And I'm going to tell you what I see, and I just want to share this from my heart at this moment. One of the things I see, and this cannot happen to us, is the enemy is doing his best to create a racial division again in the United States. And if we as the body allow this racial division to come, now I want to talk to you for a moment as believers, okay? We're believers. You may be white, but if you're in the kingdom and your name is in heaven, we're family. Okay. If you're black and your name is in heaven, we're family. If you're Hispanic and your name is in heaven, we're family. Yes. We have got to stop this mess Amen. where we make everything political in the body of Christ. Amen. 
we say, well, I'm of this or I'm of that, or you support him and you didn't support that, so we're going to divide over this. Blood should be thicker than politics. Amen. The blood... You know, the, the, the New Testament taught that we are one blood through Messiah. Yes. That, and, that, and this is the reason why, why, and we know that ethnically there's Jews, ethnically Gentiles, mm -hmm. ethnically Hispanic. We know that. But the reason Paul emphasized that through Messiah, that we're, we're one blood, we're one nation of people, is to get, the, you know, in the, in the early church, there was conflict between Gentiles being grafted in. They didn't understand right. it, okay? Yes. We're having the same thing happen today with our ethnic divisions. Yep. And we've got to sit down as, as African Americans, as white folks, as Hispanic folks, and we're going to say, wait a minute, guys. Our primary purpose is we are in the kingdom. We are a kingdom in a nation. We're from yes. another country. We're from another, that's what Paul taught. We are from another world, another country. Our priority should be unifying around Jesus Christ, Amen. the power of His blood, the power of the Holy Spirit to deliver, and let all this other stuff drop by the wayside. Uh, because I'm telling you, between the talking heads of a secular media that's ungodly, that literally despises Christianity, and preachers, pardon me, who are mamby-pamby who will not preach the truth anymore, and they become so sensitive to the feelings of other people, that they're not giving people the power of the gospel. There's a power in the preaching of the Word of God. Amen. Uh, there's, oh, I feel it. There's radical conviction, radical conversion. Saul of Tarsus was a radical conversion. There's a radical conversion that should come. And so I want to encourage, and what I see, I, this is just part of it. I see the enemy attempting to disunify and break apart the body of Christ by racial and ethnic division. It has to stop. And preachers, it has to start with you. Amen. You have to get behind your pulpit. If you're African-American, Caucasian, Hispanic, you're going to say, folks, we are the body of Christ first. Yes. We are the kingdom first. Yes. We are ki now, I know this is going to sound heavy for some people. I'm a Christian first. I'm an American next. Amen. I but love America. But that's biblical. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I'm a believer, that, that I'm a believer. I'm a believer right. first. I'm a believer first. That's a good one. Last week, you know, I, I was looking at these, this verse about nation rising up against nation. I happened to put on this Perry Stone thing. I'm like going, well, that's exactly what I need. Okay, Lord. That's exactly what the enemy is trying to do. And we cannot let it happen. So, amen. <laughs> 